All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today. Um, today is the last year of the Flex Grant year for this year. So tomorrow, September 1, is a whole new grant year. And so we wanted to end on a positive, on a great note. And so today we're, um, this is kind of wrapping up our MBQIP series for this year. And we want to talk about HCAPs, um, in particular, best practices. And so we have Janelle with Stratus Health. Um, we're fairly familiar with many folks from Stratus. We've had Carla Wang speak multiple times here in Oklahoma. We know and love Robin here in Oklahoma. And then also Sarah Breitman has been great to work with as well. And so we're really excited to get to meet another person with Stratus Health. Um, today's webinar is, we have um, some slides to go over, but we want to have as much discussion as possible. And we also have some peer facilities who are sharing things that they've implemented in their um, facilities. And so if you have things like, hey, we did this and it worked, or hey, we did this and it did not work, please speak up, share. Um, you have control over your individual microphone. Um, if you want to raise your hand, I can make sure to unmute you, but you should be able to unmute. Also, um, if you want to put stuff in the chat, I'll be watching the chat as well. We are recording today's session, and once um, we wrap, we'll get it uploaded onto our YouTube channel. I'll be sure to share these slides, um, as well as letting you all know when the link is available. So with that said, Janelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura, and hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Uh, everywhere, I, whenever I talk to people, they always love Robin, because she is so helpful with all the the data questions and uh, and that. So I have been at this company 18 years, but I'm new to this team. I can still say new about a year. Um, so my background is I'm a registered nurse. I worked in a rural uh, hospital, not quite small enough to be critical access hospital. So probably have done a lot of things that, that you all do. So, you know, the med surge, the OB, the ICU, and then the last 10 years, I that I was there, I served and directed their home care and hospice programs. Uh, since then, we relocated. So now I'm in um, Minneapolis area, uh, which is where our company is located. So the company that I work for is called uh, Stratus Health. And this is a quality and safety organization. It's private non for profit uh, based in the Twin Cities metro area. And we have staff nationally as well and do a, a lot of national work as well as in Minnesota. So we work at the intersection of research policy and practice, really meeting collaboration and innovation to drive healthcare quality and patient safety. We work across the spectrum of care. So all different kinds of healthcare organizations and providers, hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, home health agencies, et cetera. And we have a particularly long history of working with rural providers, both within our state, Minnesota, and nationally, including critical access hospitals and the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Program and the 45 state flex programs uh, like our call today. So I'm here today with the hat that Stratus Health wears, serving as the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistant. Center or Arkita. Sometimes you'll hear us refer to as Arkita or Stratus Health interchangeably in this national flex uh, world. And so this is a cooperative agreement that we have with the Health Resources and Services Administration Federal Office of Rural Health Policy or FORP, F O R H P as it's known. Um, and they're the, the group that funds your flex program. Uh, they also fund us, and that's how we get to work with you and Laura and the other state. It's uh, flex programs all over the U.S. So in our role as Arkita, we again put on that quality and safety hat, focusing on improving health outcomes, specifically looking um, for those folks in rural communities. And today we're going to be talking about HCAPs uh, as part of the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project, or MB Club. So this is the slide that we're showing of the uh, four high-performing uh, organizations or hospitals in Oklahoma that I'm hoping most of them are on that they can share some of their tips on HCAPs. And our objectives for this session are to talk about the importance of HCAPs, Hospital Consumer Assessment for Healthcare Providers and Systems, and that's the only time I'll say the whole um, phrase, otherwise we'll call it HCAPs. Survey for critical access hospitals. We'll talk about some best practices on how to improve your scores for patients in the inpatient setting. And then um, 
for you to employ interventions implemented by your colleagues in Oklahoma and national high performing uh, cause to improve the HCAP scores. So let's uh, start with an overview of HCAPs and the patient experience in the hospital. The goals, uh, as you know, through your state flex, flex program, you're asked to participate in the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project. This initiative and equip is where at the federal level through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, there's a common set of rural relevant metrics and has asked critical access hospitals nationally to report on those metrics. Then the intention is that for quality measurement, and you've probably heard the adage about quality, that you can't improve what you can't measure. So we start with quality improvement. And then based on that measurement, we can identify opportunities for improvement to ensure that we're making improvement to our quality initiatives. And then ultimately, our goal is to improve, improve the patient uh, outcomes. So we also want to be preparing critical access hospitals for participation in the value-based uh, programs, although right now CMS does not currently require critical access hospitals to report on their quality metrics or pay them based on their performance on those me measures. But we know where CMS leads, other payers follow. And many of you are probably already in some kind of payment arrangement with your insurance or your Medicaid programs or an ACO as you are working on value-based care. So we just take this as an opportunity uh, to provide some technical assistance through the state flex program to help in that regard. So starting out, let's talk about CAPS in general, C-A-H-P-S. So just take the word hospital off of that. Um, and HCAPS is a part of this. So why CAPS? Um, and something that we want to be talking about. What it really is, it's a family of surveys that's been developed for measuring the patient's perception of care. So prior to CAPS and really even right now, there are a lot of surveys, there have been and there still are a lot of surveys out there about patient experience or patient satisfaction. But what the CAPS did and thinking HCAPS was to standardize the survey and the methodology <clears throat> so that all of us are using the same approach to how we're collecting and analyzing and measuring the responses that we get from patients about their experience and various aspects of their care. So we're gonna be talking about specifically the HCAPS today, but just know that there are 11 CAPS survey totally if you go on cms.gov, so like home health, hospice, the CNG clinician and group. So you, your organization may be involved in more than one CAPS survey. And as we look at CAPS, uh, we know that it's their important driver for improvement for perception of care because the data is out there on the public domain and it is a motivator to, to want to have as best you can scores on those. So HCAPS, a uh, little background about that, it was developed by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and it offers the ability for comparing performance with other hospitals because it's standardized, like we just talked about. So the fact that all the hospitals are using the standard, same standard set of questions and the methodology for rolling it out and they're evaluated the same, it's very stringent. That means that we can actually compare with some risk adjustment to say how our hospital is performing compared to somebody else. So you can look you know, compare yourself to a hospital on the other side of the coast. You can look for kind of different patient populations that are similar. You can look at your competitor or your neighbor down the road to see how do we compare to them? Because people, patients, consumers, like somebody like me who could actually do it, go out on the web and compare hospitals when I'm shopping for a hospital. So that's the point of this, is that consumers have a place to, to find out which which hospitals are good based on um, the care compare. So as we look at how the questions are rolled out, the reason that this is a patient experience, not a patient satisfaction survey. So they are asked not to rate their satisfaction, but they're asked to answer a question, a bunch of questions for us you know, answer questions on a series of questions. So it's not, how did you like something, but 
based on this question. What is your answer? So we'll get into this in a little bit, but they have, um, I wanted to explain, they have a variety of ways to answer the questions. So uh, like in the first one, it's never, sometimes, usually, always. And what is in green on the, the slide and subsequent slides or what is called the top box score. So what that means is you get credit when your patients answer the top box score. So then there are also some um, questions that are just plain yes and no. And of course, yes, in this case, would be the top box score or maybe not quite so broad. So no, yes, somewhat, definitely yes. Probably no, definitely no, probably no, probably yes, definitely yes. So you can see on the slide the, the range of answers and then where you get the credit is the top box score. So it's really important to have that concept in mind because you may get surveys where people Maybe they say, usually the nurse is good at communicating. That's good to know, but you aren't getting the credit for it. First and foremost, in order to be able to improve on your patient experience, you need to get responses from your patients, right? So you have to talk about response rates and what does it look like to ensure that patients are responding to the surveys because you actually you want to have as many response rates as you can to get the most feedback from your patients. The different CAP surveys have, have a variety of modes for survey implementation. This slide, uh, next slide, please. yeah, this slide shows for HCAPs how people can respond. So you can have a mail only, a telephone only, there's the mixed message which is you send them a survey in the mail, and if they don't respond, then you do a, a telephone. And then they have the interactive voice response, which is they receive a phone call, but they're not talking to a person who would complete the, sur the survey. Instead, they're hearing a recorded voice, and then they hit a number to, to um, indicate their answer. So I'm just curious for those on the call today, do you know what are the modes of survey implementation that your hospital uses? And Laura, if you would mind just um, maybe reporting out what people say in the chat. Absolutely. Yes, if you would like to um, write out in the chat uh, the mode um, that your vendor uses, that'd be great. So we have one mixed email and telephone mixed. Okay, great. Does anybody use the interactive voice response? All, okay. Thank you, Dustin. All right, let's go move on to the next slide. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background there. So some strategies. So when you're thinking about your survey, it's really important to have responses uh, because if you only have a couple of people respond to your survey, it's not giving you as much information as you would like to be able to inform your patient experience intervention. So you want to be sure that you're telling your patients about a survey, that the survey is coming. And here's another thing, as I uh, keep talking, I just wanna know how are you telling your patients about the survey? So during uh, many hospitals that let their patients know ahead about it, about it, they tell their patients during the discharge planning or in discussions around discharge. You want to make sure that they know that they will receive a follow-up phone call or email. I guess for this, for the hospital, it's not email, but a phone call or something in the mail about a survey will be coming. So you want you and your staff to know which way your survey is administered so that they can be able to speak to it with patients. If someone's going to be receiving a phone call, it might be helpful to tell your patients who it's coming from, you know, because many times you, when you receive a phone call, at least I don't, I don't answer it unless I'm either expecting a call from somebody or I know who is calling me on, on my cell phone. And you can help explain, explain this to patients and the staff so that they can talk about it. Or many times hospitals may put this in a brochure or flyer and that lays out what's to be expected. You can have posters, you can have information on your hospital website or announcements that you play in your waiting room or on your TV screens because you want uh, folks to be familiar with a survey is coming and you want them to be inclined to answer it. 
And we know that there's a lot that's uh, discussed during the discharge process, right? So when you're discharging a patient, I mean, honestly, they just want to get out of there, right? So a lot of the information you say, unfortunately, isn't being locked in the, in their head. And so they would need to have some kind of other reminder about the survey is coming. And then if you use a vendor, it's helpful that the vendor gets the list of patients frequently and early. So it's not a long time delay between discharge from the hospital and when they actually get the survey. We've heard that leadership rounding is a great time to bring up the survey. So many leaders will talk to the patients about well, how's your stay now? Is there anything we can do to help you? You will be receiving this survey coming up about your care. And we'd appreciate that you complete the survey so we know how you feel that we're doing. Okay, so now uh, Laura is going to talk about the Oklahoma state level data on the patient experience. And then I'll get into the nitty gritty about some questions. Yes, and I apologize. It looks like I put this ahead of the header. So um, <laughs> we'll see that in a second. Um, but for everyone on the call, this is the state level um, FMT report that we get. And so y'all are all familiar with the reports that we send out um, on a regular basis with your uh, quarterly data for age caps for all of the NBQIP um, domains. And so this is a glance at the state level report. And so you do get this data. Um, the individual hospital reports will have your data, the state's data, and then the national um, data over on the far right-hand side. And so also, if you recall, um, if you are new, like you just started reporting your age caps data and you get a report and has a bunch of NAs in it, Hospitals must be collecting HCAPS, HCAPS data for four consecutive quarters before data show up. And the most recent reports we have are through third quarter 2021. Um, you can see this report was generated or compiled by the Flex monitor monitoring team on May 31st. And so we're think we should be getting something new, hopefully in the next month or so, um, to send out. So that would be the first quarter. 2021 through the fourth quarter, 2021. So as soon as I get it, I'll be sure to send it out. But you can see um, we have our top box column here with the always. And then we also have the national be our benchmark over here, which is like the 90th percentile um, to be aiming towards. So you can see we do have strengths, but we also have areas to work on here in Oklahoma. Um, and so you can see how we compare 83% um, with the communication with nurses, the benchmark we should be aiming for is 87%. One that I noticed that we do pretty well, cleanliness of hospital. We actually, as a state, surpass the national benchmark on that, which I think is really cool, that one. Um, but you can also see um, like care transitions, 55%, where the national benchmark is 63%. The next slide here also summarizes the last two categories. Um, our rating of the hospital, nine to 10 rating, 73% give that rating. The national benchmark is 86%. There is no benchmark for this question. And I know um, just from doing site visits and communication with hospital administrators, this is one you really like to look at, your willingness to recommend this hospital. Um, we're looking at 73%. Um, looking at the national rate, it's about 76%. So we're a little bit below that. But, um, but I know this is one while there's no benchmark, is one that folks really do pay attention to. So this is just a snapshot at the state level report. At, you know, as I send out these um, flex monitoring team reports of your data, if you ever want to have a call to talk through what does this mean or what am I looking at, please let me know. We are happy to do that. So I will turn, there's the header for this section that we just covered. And so I will turn it back over to Janelle um, to get into some improvement strategies. All right, thanks for sharing that, uh, the data for Oklahoma, Laura. And honestly, that was the first time I had seen one of the state level reports. So I appreciated being able to see that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the questions on the uh, actual HCAP survey. So before I get into that, are there any questions from you so far about HCAPs? Okay, I must, I'm assuming that it's, there's not, not any. 
Okay, so let's first talk about communication. So these are the actual questions on the survey and they ask the same questions regarding nurses and doctors. And then you can see I have the top box score in uh, green. So with nurses during this hospital stay, how often did they treat you with courtesy and respect, listen carefully to you, explain things to you in a way that you can understand. And the same question goes for doctors. And then on the next slide, so the slides that look like this, these are all the best practices. So several years ago, we, uh, Stratus Health or Arkita, we brought together high performing critical access hospitals on HCAPs to find out what are your best practices for these different domains. And so these are the, the best practices from those hospitals that I'll be sharing. And I will uh, just mention that it was uh, about five years ago that we did this and a lot in the world has changed since then, right? With COVID and everything. And so we brought a group of high performing hospitals back together just earlier this month and we will be updating uh, the report and then a like a two page uh, tip sheet on what are the best practices that are currently used. And I will say just noting that uh, many are the same, but some things have shifted a little bit. Maybe it wasn't as a high priority before, but now it's a top priority culture of a hospital is one of those. So on communication, we look at some of the key strategies for utilizing tools that are often employed in hospitals to their highest efficiency. So we look at whiteboards. So when you think about whiteboards, about 10 years ago, they were a pretty novel idea, but now most hospitals have used, uh, are using whiteboards, but are they getting utilized regularly? Are you using it as a communication tool and not just internally, but also with the patients and families? Are they designed in a way that meets the needs of the users? So if the users are the patients and families and caregivers, are they designed to meet their needs as well? Are you, when you buy your whiteboards, are you just buying something in stock that you see for a good price in bulk? And then, you know, it really doesn't fit quite your need. Or are you uh, taking input of the users into the design of it? And uh, because they will actually be used better and on a more regular basis. A bedside shift report, uh, high performing hospitals are reporting doing these. Are you doing them with your, so your patients and families are engaged? Using a template or a checklist to make sure that everything gets covered that the, key, the team is discussing with the patients as part of their team and the loved ones. Are they present, you know, whether in person or by phone? I think now during the pandemic, we learned that you don't have to, you don't have to expect the family to get there at a certain time for these um, you know, interdisciplinary team huddles with the patients or the bedside shift reports that they can easily call in or some kind of virtual, get in there virtually. Uh, looking at having observational audits related to the bedside shift report. So how do you know that they're really happening? Perhaps you'd have a charge nurse who's rounding, uh, just making on a routine basis, making sure that the bedside shift report is being done. And as you're uh, checking that out, Check to see, are patients engaged? I mean, are they really free and comfortable to ask questions and concerns during that time? Or are they just kind of talked down to uh, you know, somebody, st you know, the team standing above the bed and the patient sitting in the bed. So think about those kind of things as well. Team huddles, this is a great tool you can use. Uh, you may want to make sure that you're using a multidisciplinary team and the leaders are involved in the huddles and that you're doing them in the care units. Uh, and then you may have different structures for those team huddles depending on the need. So it might be at the beginning of the shift, like if there's a shift handoff, so you can share some of those things that might be pertinent in caring for a patient and their family. And um, you want folks to be responsive to the needs of the individuals they're serving. So looking at the next question about responsiveness of hospital staff. So the question is, after you pressed your call button, how often did you get the help as soon as you wanted it? How often did you get help getting to the bathroom or using a bedpan as soon as you wanted it? Some strategies for this one include, um, are you doing hourly rounding so that you have a standard time that the patients are at least minimally getting rounded on? Are you utilizing CNAs and other types of assistance to their highest level to be able to assist the nurses in doing the hourly rounding? When you check in on a patient, are you checking in on the four Ps? So pain, potty, position, and possession. Do they have what they need? Are they comfortable? Do they need to use a restroom? Are they in pain? 
and hourly rounding can help reduce your call light uses, usage. Ideally, patients uh, don't have their call light on because their needs are being met uh, before they maybe even know they have the need or before it's urgent. So that's a surefire way to make sure that folks are feeling confident in answering the question affirmative, affirmatively. Implementing no pass zone. Uh, this means that you have the expectation that everybody on the team answers the call light or anybody with a, maybe a hospital badge uh, answers call light. So it doesn't matter if you're the CEO, if you're dietary, if you're lab, if you're environmental service, and you're walking by a room with the call light on, you just poke your head in the room and say, hey, is there something I can help you with? Or is there somebody I can get for you? Anyone can provide non-clinical support. You know, so if it's something like their possessions, they can't reach their phone, their charger came out of the wall, they need the book on the bed stand, they want a blanket, something like that. Uh, but if they need help with like management or repositioning or those types of things, then you'd want to get the appropriate person to help them. And actually, that may decrease traffic in patient areas, just because as you're going by, the call lights on, you stick your head in, you get what they need. And then there's leveraging technological devices. And this does get to resourcing, resourcing for sure, uh, because some of that stuff is pretty expensive, but at least uh, make sure that you have a call light system and you're using it. Uh, there may be, there are different levels of sophistication with call light systems. Uh, you may have two-way speakers. So you stop, you know, pop your head in a room and they need their nurse for something who's not in the room, but you can communicate with that nurse right there. And so in a moment, you could, you know, just say, hey, I'm in so-and-so's room. They're wondering when they can get the next pain medication. The nurse can respond and then it gets on the top of the list. So the responsiveness is quicker. And as I'm going through these, if you have additional ideas, please put them in the chat. And then Laura, uh, just just stop me and share what, what you're seeing. So the next question, we're talking about medications. So medications are obviously important. And in HCAPS, uh, the questions are around, uh, during your hospital stay, before giving you any new medication, did hospital staff tell you what it was for? And did they describe possible side effects in a way that you could understand? And you can see top box score as always. So that's the one you want your patients to answer. So when it comes to communication about medications, here are some key ideas to take with you. Are you engaging pharmacy? Can you get pharmacy involved in interdisciplinary huddles and rounds? How are they involved in triggering the verification process and the medication reconciliation process to make sure that patients, when they go home, they have a clear list of meds, they know what they're for, they know that there aren't any contraindications and their record is up to date. So when they go to the clinic, their doctor knows what they were, what meds they were taken off of and what new meds they were potentially added on to. Patient education is hugely important. You know, in healthcare, we speak in a language that most common, you know, ordinary people don't, aren't familiar with. So we use words that they don't understand. And this, I mean, it happens all the time and we really need to be aware of it. So it means that things need to be written and spoken in an easy to read and understand method. They also needed to be not only written, but provide them verbally and provided in a language that's accessible to all of your patients. So if you need interpretive services, you might need things written in multiple language. Make sure that's all available. You need to be providing education whenever there's new meds on a daily basis and at discharge as a minimum. So using teach back is a great way to ensure that patients understood what they were told and can reiterate what it is. I mean, so teach back is a method that you use basically to find out whether I am doing a good job of explaining things to you. So you have the patient uh, repeat back what you said in a way that they understood. So it helps us know how we can do in our teaching, how we're doing in our teaching. And then you can use HR reminders and hard stops as well. When we think about using keywords, so we're thinking about keywords that they're going to see later in that when the HCAP survey comes to them. So this goes a long way in kind of a health literacy type of concept. You're ensuring that the things you're saying, 
is a way that will trigger our little reminder when they get the HCAP survey. So for example, you might say, I'm going to provide you with some education about your medication, not just here, here are the side effects of your med, but use the terminology that they will see in the survey. So it's really important that your staff know the questions in the survey and can understand this and, and use phrases like that to help patients uh, be more in queue when they take the survey. Okay, cleanliness and quietness. So the questions are here are during the stay. How often were your bathroom, your room and your bathroom kept clean? Was the area around your room quiet at night? And notice the top box score is always. So usually it's good, but it's not good enough to get points. So cleanliness of the hospital environment. The tips here were looking at your schedule for cleaning. So ensuring that things are clean. Do you do like kind of a deep cleaning or the big cleaning in the morning, kind of more intensive cleaning? Maybe afternoons and evenings are more for tidying up. And it can be cleaning, can be, should be everybody's responsibility, not just the responsibility of the environmental service staff. So in the evenings, it could be the nurse or the CNAs or maybe a volunteer person that just goes up goes around the rooms and tidying up. And maybe when you're doing like PM cares, that's a good time to do it. During the night when rounding is happening, just do kind of a scan of the room and, and see if things are neat and clean and easy, easily accessible. Notice is a cleaning. Hospitals are letting people know when the room is clean. You know, patients are not always either in the room or maybe paying attention when the room is being cleaned. So they might be off for like x-ray or therapy or something like that. So when they come back, there might be a little card on the bedside table, or maybe they use the whiteboard to say, hey, I cleaned your room. Let me know if there's anything else you need and provide you know, the, the contact information if they need something else related to the cleaning. And then doing audits to ensure that the cleanliness is actually happening. Some hospitals use the ATP monitoring or the glow gel monitoring, or maybe just doing some inspections when rounding is happening. Um, and this would include like even rounding in the evening to see are people actually tidying up uh, before the patient has settled for the night and seeing which nurses and CNAs are good at that and which might need a little bit of extra coaching. And then we, when we think about quietness of the hospital environment, uh, think about awareness. So do folks know who are the uh, are like aware of like the noise monitors, they call it. So, you know, uh, somebody that's kind of just paying attention to the, how loud it is on the floor for the patients and then remind the staff. I've heard of hospitals that have something called a shh campaign <laughs> where there are certain folks that remind staff on a regular basis that we're trying to keep things quiet because people are healing here. And then having, you know, some hospitals have reminders, whether they're verbal, written, or scheduled, it might just be in real time, just reminding about the staff. Because, you know, I mean, I've been, I've worked on floors too, and you get a, a bunch of staff together, and it does kind of escalate and get, um, get a little bit noisier. Structural changes. So think about enclosed nursing stations or decentralized nursing stations. Hospital had moved for a while to nursing stations that were pods, like in the middle of the rooms. That can be really efficient for access to care, but it can also be really loud when you think about gathering uh, can, you know, all those nurses together outside of the rooms. Think about using carpets and flooring padding to keep the noise down. Hospitals are a pretty sterile environment, so where you can use some of those things, uh, that's a good uh, technique for keeping things a little quieter. And then also consider environmental noise. So are the things like squeaky doors, squeaky carts, you know, banging around when you're you're moving things, scheduling, uh, cleaning, and maintenance services at times. Um, you know, not like too early in the morning or middle of the night, that kind of stuff. When are staff coming in? And you can see this question also ties to the previous question about cleaning. And then using communications devices to help reduce overhead noise. So if you have those two-way communications devices with the nurses, use those as opposed to using overhead announcements. And if you do have overhead announcements, really being aware of when they're happening and how frequently you're using those. 
When it comes to discharge information and care transitions in HCAPS, these are two different domains, but they're very much related in our minds. They're not so much related as it turns out on how we perform in them. Discharge information is pretty straightforward. The answers are yes or no. And the questions are, you know, during the hospital stay, did the doctor, nurse, or other hospital staff talk to you about whether you would have help you needed when you left the hospital? Yes or no. Did the information, uh, did you get it, the information in writing about symptoms and health problems? Yes or no. So, you know, yes would be pretty easy to answer. But then when you look at the transitions of care questions, um, they are more on the scale. So did this hospital, during this hospital stay, staff took my preference and those of my family or caregiver into account in deciding what my health care needs would be when I left. And then it's on that scale. So you want them to answer strongly agree, even though agree is good, strongly agree is best because that's the top um, scoring. When I left the hospital, I had a good understanding of the things responsible for managing my health. And when I left, I clearly understood the purpose for taking each of my meds. And as it turns out, care transitions is the domain that hospitals, PPS and critical access have the most opportunity to improve. And I had glanced at uh, the Oklahoma report that Laura had shown. I noticed that it resonates well with you as well, that that's an opportunity, care transitions to work on to improve. So, so we lumped together the um, best practices because, you know, they do fit together and you really want to um, improve the care transitions. And that's the one that's more on that the scale. So some of the things that we can do around both of those are to ensure that discharge planning starts at admission. We should immediately be thinking about what happens when this patient leaves, and we should be engaging them in that discussion so they're hearing it over, you know, more than once, more than right before they walk out the door. Include social workers, care managers, and discharge nurses. So uh, make it clear who's responsible for that discharge planning process. And it might be any number of those, or maybe you have somebody else that's responsible. Engaging or discharge planning whenever you're doing huddles or rounds. So again, that this would be at the bedside or it could be at those team huddles that should change, making sure that everybody on the team even has the, the information they need. So there's interdisciplinary involvement across the sections. And you want to engage uh, who is responsible for this person when they leave the hospital. And then thinking about discharge education. Uh, some facilities use discharge packets or a folder or a binder. Um, pretty much everybody gets a written discharge instruction care plan or an after visit summary, but is it provided in a way that they can understand? Is it written in simple language that someone reviews with them rather than just handing them a whole big stack of papers? And because you know what happens to those papers, right? Uh, so you want somebody to go over, make sure the patient understands, is engaged, and use teach back as you uh, provide that education to them. Some opportunities exist after the patient has left, uh, making sure that you're able to engage in the discharge follow-up calls or home visits. So many hospitals will do telephone calls two to three days after uh, a person is discharged. So talking about you know, how they're doing and questions and that kind of thing. And it's a great time to remind them that a survey will be coming and you'd appreciate them to fill it out. Uh, for the follow-up phone calls, some hospitals call everybody. Some don't have capacity to do that. So they prioritize patients that may be at high risk for readmission or high risk for not going to their follow-up PCP appointment. Uh, and so, you know, just depending on your capacity there. Some hospitals are able to do home visits. Um, they're very effective, but less common. I've heard of hospitals that may offer a free home visit by a nurse. If they have their own home health agency, they utilize that. So then it's just a free visit. They're not going through the whole Medicare home care admission, or they may subcontract with a home care agency to do a, a visit. Also a good time to remind about the survey coming. Okay, the overall rating and willingness to recommend, and that was the one that didn't have a benchmark, the willingness to recommend. So this is the one where 
um, the person is asked using any number from zero to 10, or zero is the worst and 10 is the best possible care, what number, how would you rate this visit or this hospitalization? And then the second question is, and, you, and top box for that one is nine or 10. So, so eight is good, but it's not what you get credit for. And then would you recommend this hospital to your family and friends? And top box is definitely yes. And that's the one you would want them to answer. So some strategies uh, related to those are what we call global measures. Uh, they're really difficult to figure out, and it's not exactly a composite as it's a separate question because you may have patients who would answer, give you like top box scores on a lot of those other questions. But then when it gets to this recommend and overall rating, you might get something lower. And you're trying to figure out, well, you know, what is it? How, you know, how come they gave us high rates, but not the highest on this? So that's where it would be helpful if you have a vendor and they could maybe do some analysis for you. For example, you may be able to figure out that patients that had, they rated nurse communication, just for example, I'm just making that up, but high nurse communication scores also would have a high recommend score or maybe say lower on a certain question and lower on their willingness to recommend. That way you could work on those other measures and hopefully improve your, the recommended scores. So some of the things we look at are behaviors of leaders uh, to improve this. And one of them is leader engagement in the patient experience. Have, have leaders really bought into the patient experience? Are they visible to patients? Do they make rounds with staff? Is there leadership development? and opportunities for the leadership. And what is the culture at your facility? And this is the one that went up to like the top priority in the latest uh, focus group that we did with high performing. So is there an understanding of the standards of behavior around patient experience where it's everybody's responsibility for patient experience? Is there some camaraderie and teamwork involved? Is there accountability for everybody with patient experience? Also looking at the data where you share the data, like the HCAPS results with staff and letting them know how people respond, letting them know what the actual questions are so they know how they're being basically assessed. And it provides for opportunities for discussion. Like, do you do that? For example, you may have staff that see a score that's either good or not so good and would have some great ideas on how they can make some improvement. Some hospitals do some friendly competition and momentum. So maybe there is a certain area or um, that does well. Uh, put a little competition there uh, and to build some momentum for improvement. Some overarching themes that we've noticed throughout um, the HCAPs are leadership and culture are key to patient experience. We always hear that you know things start at the top and it's true for this as well. And when patients and families know that the leadership is engaged, uh, that does make an input and impact and you can see that uh, resulted on your scores. And we want to ensure that there are effective, clear, and concise and efficient communication among team members and with patients and families related to this. Engaged employees go a long way toward patient experience. And then there's also the notion when we think about workforce resilience, and we're not talking about resiliency in terms of just keeping do, doing more with less, but are we giving staff what they need in terms of support, like the scripting, for example, or knowing what the questions are or knowing what the results are? You want to be able uh, to have staff to be able to adapt in the moment as they need it, as people are um, asking questions. And again, I think we can go back to like the scripting and support for them and the tools for staff, particularly when you think of what everybody has gone through with the COVID-19 and some of the situations that have come up. Okay, this slide just shows uh, the first two bullets. So uh, the report that we did, the one is I know, like 20 some pages where it's the full report on the high performers. The second one is a two pager, which gets um, down to the 
just the nitty gritty and the best practices by measure. We will be updating both of these shortly and they will be sent out uh, through the FLEX programs. And the last one is if you want more details about and guidelines and standardization about the HCAPs. So now we're going to hear some, from some of um, our high performing hospitals here in Oklahoma and others as well for your some of your best practices. What are you doing? And Laura, thanks for leading this discussion. Yes, thank you, Janelle. And um, thank you to the folks who have agreed to participate and agreed to share your expertise. Um, you see a listing of hospitals here on this um, page. These are four of the five facilities that we have here in Oklahoma that will be recognized in a few weeks in Kansas City at the National Rural Health Association's Critical Access Hospital Co Conference for Quality. And so once we found out about that, I reached out and I was like, hey, would you like to speak on our webinar? Um, and so I don't know if everyone is able to join today, but I did see some familiar names on the call. And so um, I saw uh, Patty and Dustin with Kingfish, Mercy Hospital Kingfisher. I know Dustin will probably be speaking for both Kingfisher and Logan County, but um, if you guys would like to go ahead and share some of the best practices or things that you've implemented in your facility. Sorry, Laura, can you guys hear me now? I didn't unmute first, so. Yes, we can. Okay, hey, um, yeah. My name is Dustin Yao. I work at um, Mercy Hospital Kingfisher at Mercy, Mercy Hospital Logan County as the director of operations um, overseeing um, most most departments that are that are uh, non-nursing and non-provider. Um, just first wanted to uh, thank Janelle uh, for, for her comments and suggestions. That was a really good presentation and um, took a lot of notes on our end uh, that, of things that some, some of which we do and some of which um, some of which we don't right now. So just wanted to say thank you for thank you for offering that up. Um, I think um, you know what I could offer up as far as um, there, there, there's a couple different things and maybe maybe Patty, if you want to take the uh, the actions that we take, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that off to you. Uh, what I, what I specifically want to talk about though is the data that, that we have access to and I think that's what uh, has helped us uh, immensely. Um, and, and HCAPs included in that uh, more recently. And so we use a vendor, uh, we're, and, I, and I say all this with the caveat of, um, you know, being in a system we're fortunate because we get to, to really take advantage of what Mercy does uh, on a system-wide level uh, from a data perspective. And so we have a vendor that we partner with uh, that does our patient satisfaction work for us. They survey um, essentially every patient that walks through our ED here and uh, every patient that gets an outpatient service in our in our critical access facilities, and so we see that data. Uh, it's actionable. It's it's. Uh, I, I would say, uh, not real time is is uh, you know that, defining that is is kind of tough. But we get it back pretty quickly after our patients leave. They're surveyed very quickly, just like in HCAP. Um, but what makes this partnership unique is that this same vendor, NRC, is the vendor. There are also our HCAP. Um, uh, vendor. So, so they do both the patient satisfaction side and the HCAP surveys. Um, the reason that's important for us uh, and what's the, what, what that has offered uh, to our small facilities out here is they are able to share uh, our raw, what I would say is our raw HCAP data with us long before, uh, much quicker than what we receive it uh, when we get it from um, Laura from you. And, and so, what happens is, is they collect that data. Of course, there's a six-week period there. Uh, I believe it's post-discharge. Um, but they can collect that data and give the raw data to us and so that we can see what's happening much quicker. Um, I think that's been the challenge uh, for our critical access areas is always, um, you know, to be actionable on something that, you know, maybe three quarters or four quarters old uh, has been a challenge for us. Uh, you have staff turnover. You have different leadership come in, uh, it, not only at maybe at the administrator level at times, but also of course in your manager and supervisor level. And so uh, I just offer that up, that if you have an opportunity uh, to work with your vendor in that sense, getting that raw data, I was actually on a call this morning uh, with, with um, our patient satisfaction manager in Oklahoma City, and we were looking at June's data, uh, raw, raw HCAPs data for June, which we've never really had access to that. 
um, before that quickly. Um, you'll still see, you know, um, you know, not a ton of surveys on the HCAP side. There's, there's still challenges with that. Uh, but I will say that that access to that raw data has um, has been uh, has been a, a very big plus for us. So uh, I'll pause there. Um, again, that's you know, like I said, I know we're fortunate to have that. Uh, and just ask Patty, you know, to talk about the leader rounding and some of the other things that we do. Uh, and certainly, you know, whether it be on this call or outside of this call, if anybody has any questions I can help with, certainly, certainly would be glad to do that. Hi, Patty. I'm, I'm trying to get you unmuted. Um, but is there anyone else in Kingfisher or Guthrie that would like to share as well? All right. Well, um, I noticed that we did have Tia on um, from Tishomingo. Tia, would you like to share anything that you guys have implemented there in Tishomingo that you've seen successful or it didn't work out as you planned. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So just like Dustin said, we also have uh, that NRC resource um, where I'm able to go in and follow up our HCAPs and our real times for ER and outpatients. Um, so a couple of things that we have really been wanting to work on is um, for our patients, you know, because they come here and our swing bed are here for a while. So we want to make it a really welcoming, friendly environment. So we try to give them the most patient preferences as they can. And whenever I say this, I include, um, we have meal alternatives. We have, um, we have, which we do our dietary assessments, which are given to our uh, dietary. And we, uh, we are also taking into account, you know, their bathing times. Uh, you know, not everybody is a daily person. They're more of an afternoon or not in their therapy times. So we want to we try to keep the patient preferences to the highest, you know, to the highest standard that we can. And also one thing that we have really been trying to work on, because I have a problem with taking something that's pretty good and, and seeing ways to Make it even greater, I guess you would say. Um, so one thing that has really, really, really helped us here is our telemedicine. Our telemedicine, um, you know, our hospitalist and our uh, PAs and nurse packs that are here on site, that has really worked to increase our quality of care and our patient satisfaction and our patient outcomes. Um, when I say this, uh, I mean, you know, we really like to start on the communication and the patient's health condition and management of medications and signs and side effects whenever they're admitted. We start that process and we we utilize our providers, we utilize our nurses, and we utilize our pharmacy managers for those things. And uh, we continue these through discharge um, in any any new updates, you know. The family and patients really appreciate whenever they have questions or concerns to have them promptly, you know, if the nurses can't handle it, have them promptly, you know, addressed by the providers. And um, so we are also utilizing a lot of technology. I, uh, we work to make sure that our patients and our patients' family and caregivers are engaged uh, during the patient's stay, um, I try to, and I, I do call reminders and we put signs on our whiteboards for our weekly case conference meetings. We will utilize um, uh, teams whenever family members can't be here where they can call in. We've had family members on FaceTime before. We've had family members um, on our speaker phone and caregivers. We've had family members here they had other family members on their speakerphone to get people engaged in part of the discharge planning process whenever they 
you know, come and to be um, updated weekly on these things. And so that is one of our biggest things is we really like to make sure that the patients feel like they have a choice and they have the preferences and that they're really, you know, understanding why they're here, any change in, in, any change in condition, any change in meds, and we just are trying to increase that quality of care and, and improve patient outcomes. Then patient satisfaction. <laughs> and that's about all I got right now. Well, that's great. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, I did want to go back real quick um, and see if Patty was able to unmute. I don't believe we have anyone um, on the line at the moment from Jefferson County. Um, but with that said, I was just going through the um, participants and we have um, some folks that I know have been in your positions for a while and have been um, working on these uh, priorities. And so feel free to unmute and share what you're doing in your facilities. Um, Emily and O'Keen, not to put you on the spot, but I know that you guys over the years have really looked at age caps and um, implemented like uh, the rounding and stuff. So would you guys like to share? Well, um, I don't do a lot with age caps, Laura. Um, Tammy Jansen does. Uh, I'm on here. Okay, do you want to, Tammy, talk about it? Well, um, we we changed vendors, um, I don't know, it's been maybe a couple of years, it seems like six months ago, but it's probably been two years, uh, which really helped with our turnaround time. Um, and I actually send them the data every two weeks instead of on a monthly basis, so they can get going on our discharges a little bit quicker. Um, our previous COO had, or CEO had started where she would go in and visit with the patients every day and give them, or the new admits, and give them her card, um, which I thought was working really well, but that's kind of dropped off since we've changed administration. Emily does a really good job of uh, telling them that discharge um, to expect the phone call, and then when she does her follow-up calls, I think she probably reminds them again. Um, so. Our issue that I find is that they don't, the patients don't always answer always or yes, definitely. And so, you know, like she said, you don't get credit for it usually. Um, so, you know, our surveys look good, but the score may not necessarily be what it needs to be. So, and I don't, you know, we, we need to come up with some ways to coach the patients maybe without actually coaching the patients on how they need to answer those questions. Has anybody encountered that? Janelle, what would you recommend? Because I know, I'm like, you know, when you get your car serviced, you can't say anything but always or the highest one is failing. You can't say that to a patient. So um, what, what would you suggest or what have you heard folks do? Yeah, so there are you know, rules where, like you said, you can't tell people how to respond or that. So I think the scripting where your staff uses and more than once the same, some of the same words that are in the survey, you know, like I gave the example with the education on medication. Um, like I'm providing, yeah. you know, that's what I would say and try to work on some of the scripting related to some of the questions. So it like rings a bell and then they answer, you know, the, the top box score for those. Okay. And I don't know that we've really explained the whole top box scoring. Um, I mean, you explained it in a pretty good way where I kind of understand it more, but we don't usually use that wording. I think when we talk to our patients and maybe that's, yeah. I don't know. That would and I, pro I probably would, wouldn't go into yeah, okay. that level with the patients. Um, yeah. But yeah, because you want them, basically you want them to say always. <laughs> right. <laughs> and even though usually is pretty good, you know, they'd be like an 80%, that's pretty good. You want the hundred. 
that might not be a bad idea to really push in our discharge follow-up calls then, you know, we're hoping that you were always, you know, satisfied and those kind of answers. Yeah. yeah. All right. Would anyone else like to share or have any questions real quick? I know we're getting close to time, but um, we have a great crowd on here. Laura, this is Robin from Logan. Yes. And the only thing I would like to add is when they were talking about the key words, I know that we have rounding is something that sometimes the patient doesn't realize what rounding meant. And so our nurses, our techs would round, but they would not use that key word. And so they just thought they were getting checked on. So then we made it an effort to really come in and say, hey, we were going to round. We're just rounding on you. Want to know what you needed? If you need anything, do the P's and go through it that way. But because we use the word rounding, then when they reckon they did their survey, they recognized it. And there was that other words, but that's the one that came to mind. I think that's what they were talking about. It's keywords at key times. I think that helps. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else real quick? All right. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Janelle. I know you have a few slides wrap up um, of some resources. Yeah, we can go through these really quickly. These are resources that um, our organization de develops for you. I'll tell you, this is a monthly e-newsletter. You probably get it from Laura. The next one will be coming out soon, probably in the middle of next week. Have all kinds of tips and articles. Uh, we have something called these quality time sharing pies where the quality QI mentors have shared some lessons learned. And we have a new group of mentors that will be uh, doing some kind of storytelling. Uh, and that'll be starting next year. I've been writing the feature articles about them. So it was so fun to get to know these uh, great quality leaders throughout the country. And we have this course called the Quality Improvement Basics. If you have somebody new at your organization that's not so familiar with uh, quality improvement, you can do these modules. They're like half hour each, and there's a number of them, but they get the basics of quality improvement. We are updating this, so that'll be coming out at some point. And then this is a toolkit on quality improvement implementation. The web link is there. Those are the topics. And any any questions for me? I love the sharing that you guys did, hearing about the data from you, Dustin, and uh, what you said, Tia, about trying to give people the preferences. All right. Well, thank you, Janelle, for um, sharing with us. And we're looking forward to you presenting again with us and um, getting to know you. So. Thank you guys for everyone for joining. Again, we did record this and we will get this posted on our YouTube channel soon. If you have any questions or if you're like, hey, Janelle said something, but I want to, I have a follow-up. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to place you in touch. And as always, if you have any questions um, regarding age caps or any of the quality measures, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you guys and everyone have a great day.